handlers in practice. If you specifically have a touch-based device, for touch-based devices, there is a special mode called as a touch mode, okay? specifically for touch-based devices, those that, that uh, have a touch screen. What happens is the touch mode is activated for the device at a time when you are making use of the device in its touch uh, mode of operation. Okay. In this case, now notice that if you do not have this touch mode, even for touch devices, you need to highlight those items that were selected on the screen. Now, if you didn't have a touch mode, then you need to somehow tell the user which one they have selected before they press the button. So if you're using, for example, um, let me see. Uh, I think it is better illustrated with an example. Uh, let me see if I have an app that I can demonstrate to you. Some of these are much better done by actually showing you examples. So, for example, if I uh, if if I have a user interface like this with buttons and a bit with icons on the screen, I can use this to the trackball to move around on the icons. Unfortunately, this guys did not implement it correctly, so it was gone. <laughs> See, I'm, this is how I test examples. This is a bad implementation. <laughs> so what happens is that, okay. Bad implementation. Or for that matter, yeah. Well, anyway, even on the regular screen, as you can see, if I am just using the keypad to move around, I need to be able to be reminded by the system which one I am currently focusing on. And that is done by highlighting, oh, that disappeared. That is done by highlighting the item on the screen with an orange glow in the back, okay? But this is fine if I'm using only physical keys for doing my selection and so on. But in touch mode, for example, if I simply, uh, when I touch an item, I simply touch an item, okay? In touch mode, if I have a touch screen, I don't need to be reminded about what I am selecting because the location where I put my finger automatically tells me what I'm focusing on. So for touch capable devices, you don't necessarily have to, to highlight the item that you're selecting. So for touch capable devices, when you, but then a device like this has both touch capability as well as hardware keys. So when the user is navigating using the hardware keys, you still need to be able to allow them to to, to recognize which one they are currently focused on. So if the user is using hardware keys, you should put the device in non-touch mode so that the hardware keys can be used to navigate. But when the user is touching the screen using the fingers, then it should be operating in the touch mode. So this switching between touch mode and non-touch mode has to be appropriately taken care of. Okay, uh, so the touch mode is activated when the user touches the screen. So how do you jump into the touch mode? The moment the user touches the screen, then you immediately recognize that the user is interacting with the device using the touch screen, so you should jump into the touch mode, so you don't need to highlight items on the screen. But if the user now switches to using one of the hardware keys, then you immediately recognize, oh, the user is no longer touching the screen, so we have to explicitly 
indicate to the user which part of the screen the user is currently focusing on. And that has to be in the non touch mode. Okay? Now, uh, now, in this case, like for example, for text editing widgets and so on, you have to, uh, uh, those kind of widgets, they will have to be focused on even in the touch mode because, for example, you have an edit text box and then you select the edit text box. You need to highlight that edit text box and then to indicate to the user that the user is inputting information into the edit text box and so on. So, those things are focusable even in touch mode. To indicate, like for example, you have uh, the, uh, in this case, for example, you have the um, search box up top there. The moment you touch the search box, you notice that the search box is now highlighted. And so whatever I am typing with my keyboard directly goes into the search box. Okay, so that is focused mode. Even though I am using touch mode, but this is a, uh, uh, these kind of widgets will have focusable mode, meaning that subsequent interaction is directly delivered to that particular widget. So some cases you need such uh, uh, approaches and so on. Other views that are touchable, touchable views like buttons, <coughs> you don't need to highlight them and so on. And so they will not take focus. They get highlighted only at the moment you touch them, and the moment you lift your finger, the highlight is removed, as you can see in this particular case. So for example, if I touch an item on the screen, if I, the moment I touch an item on the screen, it is, you can see a momentary highlighting of the item, and the moment I remove it is gone, okay? So it is indicating that the system has recognized that you have touched that item, for the duration, and that is good enough. But whereas, if you are using the uh, using the uh, physical keys, you keep it highlighted explicitly. So this is the non-touch mode. So two different modes of operation. But of course, most of the recent devices are all completely coming with touch screens. You no longer have many non-touch based uh, uh, devices anymore. Even Android has more or less. Uh, the Android people have recognized that. Um, the newer devices that are coming are completely touch based so they have even abandoned all the hardware keys completely and made everything into soft touch keys directly on the screen so for uh, if you look at android 4.0.3 for uh, android 4 onwards everything has become screen based <coughs> or touch based you no longer have hardware keys specifically devoted to performing uh, operations Okay, now uh, in non-touch mode, as you move from item to item, you need a method of telling the user of how to navigate. That is, if you have a whole bunch of widgets that you lay out on your screen, as you scroll through, see, using using a scroll um, 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 trackball like this. Depending on which way you move, you need to interpret how to select the particular item. Look, this particular device doesn't have a mouse or a mouse pointer. See, if you are used to using your, your laptops and so on, you have a mouse pointer. So you know exactly where you are focusing by looking at the mouse pointer. Think back at how you do selections in your standard laptops and desktops. You follow the mouse cursor, right? There is no cursor on these devices. So you need other forms of indication for the user. Okay? And when the user navigates or moves from one side to the other side, in touch mode, of course, it's more straightforward because you're touching the specific point on the screen to select it. But in non-touch mode, if you're using, say, for example, the trackball to move, you need to be able to shift the focus from one widget to another widget. And that is taken care of by, uh, by this algorithms. So the focus movement is based on an algorithm which finds the nearest neighbor in a given direction. So if you're trying to move left to right, if you have a button here and then you have a another uh, button there, 
it knows that if you're moving from left to right, your focus has to be shifted from this button to that. If you're moving up to down, it has to be shifted. Sometimes you might have but buttons positioned in a strange way, one here, one on the right side, another one <coughs> here, and so on. So you should be able to shift between focuses when you are using the trackball and so on. So those kind of things you can explicitly control by specifying, <coughs> say for example, um, in this example, suppose you have like a button here and a button here, okay? If you want to, uh, uh, to move from this button to this button, then you can explicitly specify Android next focus up bottom to this button and the Android next focus down top and so on. So you can explicitly specify after this button selection if the user moves, move to the, this button and vice versa and so on. So you can control how the selection of the widgets on the screen is controlled. Again, with touch screens this is becoming less important but still something for you to think about. So that sort of summarizes some issues with respect to the user interface. Again, I didn't go into specific details of specific user interface widgets themselves that they can use. Those examples will be in the lab. Like for example, the use of buttons, the use of uh, progress bars, the use of, uh, of uh, uh, text fields and so on. I will illustrate them in the lab exercises. Those things are more easy to pick up, so I don't focus on that, but instead I focus on things that are more important in terms of designing applications in, uh, during the course. So we looked at view hierarchy in Android, how the views are organized into a, into a tree, a kind of hierarchy. We looked at event-driven programming a little bit, uh, not a whole lot of detail, and then in specific, we looked at how events are handled in Android using event listeners and event handlers. These are things that you need to explicitly implement in code inside the Android uh, uh, activities and so on. So we looked at them specifically. <coughs> so when you design applications, you need to design applications in a way that it is easy to manage, easy to upgrade and so on. And so, one of the suggested methods for implementing user interface based applications is the model view controller framework. Uh, if you have taken a course in software engineering, you are all familiar with uh, software frameworks and so on. Must have been mentioned somewhere or other during your course. But in, in a sense, a framework or what we call as an architecture or a design pattern is something that is a suggested way of implementing things in software. Okay? Again, you don't necessarily have to follow it to the rule, but the model view controller design framework has been very effectively used for designing applications which have a significant user interaction and some amount of background work to be done. So it's a software engineering architectural pattern. Now the idea behind doing something using the model view controller framework um, is that you keep your domain logic or your application logic separate from the way things are presented on the screen. This separation, again, it's not a requirement, but it's a suggested way of implementing applications. What exactly does this mean? Now, if you do applications in iOS, for example, iOS is very, very strict that you need to follow this pattern. Okay? In iOS, you have something called model view, view controller, model view, MVVC pattern that they use, and you have to stick to that. So you don't have a choice there. In Android, they don't enforce this strictly but it is a very good design pattern for you to use. Now, what exactly is this MVC framework? And how can we make use of it in designing applications? Now, in this implementation, what we do is we separate our application 
designed into three parts. First one, view. The second one called as model. And the third one called as a controller. Now, why is this separation? And what exactly do each of these do in practice? I'll go through more details in the next few slides. The idea is that the model basically captures all the details about your application logic. Okay? The, uh, the um, data and the way you manipulate the data and so on. That's one, uh, one example. At the lowest form, this could be as simple as a database. But in general, it will be more than that, the logic part. If you are implementing a game, for example, this is where the logic part of the game goes in. The way the information is rendered on the screen is controlled by the view. Okay? View is primarily focused on presenting information to the user, showing information to the user, and then providing a method for the user to send, to interact with the application. And the job of the controller is that whenever the user does some kind of action, like some kind of events on the view, now remember that the user only sees the view, what is presented on the screen. The user interacts with, with the screen, with the elements of the screen. And that interaction will be delivered to the controller, and the controller transforms that user interaction into appropriate changes that need to be done in the in the underlying logic. Okay? And this separation, clear separation in terms of the, uh, the way these three interact is very, very useful in designing a well-designed application, very well-interacting application. So, <coughs> again, I don't claim expertise in this area, but I just wanted to show you that this is a method of doing things. Now, in, in the, uh, uh, now you can find a little bit more information about model view controller at this um, uh, particular um, uh, Wikipedia site, uh, if you need to read more and pointers to other locations. So what exactly is the MVC framework? In the MVC framework, the model, I mean, at the, at the base, the model is primarily concerned with maintaining data, okay? maintaining the state of your application and so on. The view is primarily concerned with displaying this information to the users. Okay? So the actual storage of data is relegated to the model, and how the data is manipulated and so on is only in the model. What the view does is the view takes information from the model and then just displays things in the screen. So if the, view, if the model is storing a database, the view will simply retrieve information from the database and then display things in the screen. That's all the job of the view. And then the view will deliver user interactions to the controller. And it is the controller's job to reflect any changes into the model. The view does not directly go and manipulate the model. The model will not directly interact with the view uh, uh, for, for this purpose. So the controller is mediating between the model and the view and handling events that affect the model or the view. Changes to the model's data results in updating dependent views. So for example, if you have um, made some changes to like, for example, you put in some text. In, in, for example, you have a search box on the screen, and then you put in some text on the search box, and then click the enter, enter button or click the search button on the screen. This would result in this information being transferred to a controller. And it's the job of the controller to, to send that query to the model. The model will do the search and then return the results. And this results will be displayed by the view. So this clear separation has to be done. Now, the reason why we try to do this is as follows. The model primarily manages the behavior and the data of the application. And so a single model 
can be used for storing data for several different purposes. So for example, you could implement a model as a backend on, on a server, for example. You could implement the model on the server. You store all your data on the server and so on. And then within your application, you might put a plugin to the server side. And so any interactions that you do will result in queries being sent to the server side. And then results return from the server side and then you may be displaying things on the screen. That's about it. But the same server side could be used, for example, to, to host a web page based interaction with the same server too. You could have a mobile device based interaction with the same server. You could have web based interaction with the same server and so on. But the model, the actual data storage is in the model side. And any manipulations to the data storage is done only on the server side. So you can, if you want to think of it that way, you can look at the model as a server whose primary job is to store the data and manipulate the data. And it allows people to read in information and display on the screen. If you use a mobile device to read in the information and display on the screen, that is one way of delivering. You could use the same model to support a web page, web page based access to the same data on, on the server side and so on. So, the model will respond to requests for information about its state. So the state of your application is the responsibility of the model. Okay? <coughs> and whenever anybody sends instructions to change the state, the model will make a change in the state. And then that change of state may require the user interface to be updated. And that will be done by, for example, in event-driven systems. Whenever there is a change in the state of the model, in the, st in the, uh, in the model, then it will notify what are called as observers. What are observers? Observers are usually views that want to be notified whenever there is a change in the model. So for example, if you are implementing a game and then you shoot a, uh, uh, a uh, say for example, you have a shooting game and you shoot a bullet at somebody, or, or let's, let's go to another uh, case. Suppose you are implementing a football game and then you have a player that kicks the football and you need to reflect the change of the football's location. The physics of the game has to be implemented as a model the location of the football and everything is tracked in the model. But then when the user kicks the football on the screen, obviously the force with which the user kicks the football and so on will be transferred through the controller to the model. The model will compute the new location of the football and then the football's new location will be updated in the model. But then when the football's new location is updated in the model, it will have to reflect back onto the screen so that you update the user's view of the football's location on the screen. And so that has to be delivered back to the screen. Now the view's job is only to show the current location of the football. Right? So any change in the state of the model has to be reflected back to the screen to show the new position of the football. And so what the screens will, what the views will do is they will keep up. Uh, they will act as observers. Observer pattern is one more method that, that we use in MVC framework. So views are, are uh, uh, implemented as observers. Any change in the model's state will cause the view to update itself. Okay? And that, whenever the information change, so that it can be delivered to the user. So this is the model part of the, uh, of the interaction. The second one, is the view. What is the job of the view? The job of the view is to simply render the information for the user, for the user to be able to see in a suitable form. If the view is being implemented on a mobile phone, you will make use of all the features of the mobile phone screen user interface elements to draw the screen appropriately. If the same user interface is being implemented using a web page, you may make use of JavaScript and the jQuery 
and uh, Ajax and so on to deliver such interaction to the screen there and so on. So multiple views for a single model for different purposes, depending on what you want to be able to see on the screen. And a viewport is a way you get access into the model's state information. For example, in some cases, you may only permit read queries on the model's information. And so when you do a read query, information can be reflected on the screen. You will not be allowed to change anything. In the model. That is one way of viewing the model information. Another kind of interaction may allow you to both view as well as modify the, the uh, information in the backend system. And that can be allowed also. Okay. The control. What does the controller do? Now, instead of the view directly manipulating the model, because the reason why we don't want the view to directly manipulate the model is that the view should be kept as independent of the model as possible. That's the important thing to remember. Now, the controller's job is that whenever the user interacts with the screen, the corresponding changes have to be reflected back to the model. Now what happens is that if you implement it using the model view controller framework, the model implements everything. The model could be treated, for example, as a Java object with a bunch of methods. That is one at the lowest form you can view it as such. And if you want to implement two different ways of interacting with the model, all that you need to do is redesign a different view and a different control. And that's about it. And this separation is very much effectively used for implementing applications. Now, this may not make much sense to you at this moment, but as you are implementing your application, get back to this one more time, and then you will realize why it is important to separate the model and the view and the control. Because you will pretty soon realize that if you make a mess of everything together, you will end up with a very difficult to maintain application. It's always a good idea to separate the two. So this is sort of summarizes the, uh, the MVC framework as such. Okay. Uh, now, in particular, in case of Android, how does it work in practice? Android and how does Android Android doesn't directly support the MVC framework, but we can leverage some of the features in Android to implement our applications as model view controller framework. Okay? Now, in Android you have seen user interface layouts, right? In the examples that you have seen so far. How do you implement like user interactions when the user clicks on the screen, for example? You implement them as on click, on uh, on touch, on this, on that, and so on. Different kinds of uh, event listeners and event event uh, handlers. In some sense, those event listeners and event handlers are acting like controllers. Now, if you want to strictly separate the controller, what you could do is every event listener, every event handler that is invoked may simply send a message to a controller which you implement separately and let that controller directly manipulate the backend model. That's one way of implementing. Now, <coughs> so what happens is user interaction will result in the controller updating the and whenever there is an update in the model, this will result in an invalidate signal being delivered to the view. And whenever an invalidate signal is delivered to the view, that will force the view to redraw itself. Okay? We don't see this explicitly in the examples so far, but when you come to 2D and 3D graphics, you will explicitly see the use of invalidate. In 2D and 3D graphics, you have to redraw the screens at regular intervals. And one way of forcing the redraw is to use invalidate, which we'll come to 
during the Okay, That's one place where you would see the use of uh, the MVC in, in, in more detail there. So again, in Android, the model is mainly concerned about data and logic. View is about the user interface part, and the controller responds to UI events and supports the event queue. Okay. Now, when, when the user interacts with the screen, events are deposited into the queue, and the framework removes each event in sequence and dispatches it. In response, the event handler is activated, and the event handler causes suitable updates to the state of the program. Now, within Android, fortunately or unfortunately, the event handlers and the event listeners are embedded inside the activity. Okay? So what happens is your user interactions will cause an event handler or an event listener to be invoked. And those are the ones that will cause a change in your application. Selection of a button, typing information into an edit, edit text box, clicking the search uh, uh, button on the screen, and, so, and doing gestures on the screen. All of these are user interactions, but they will result in a corresponding event handler being or event listener being invoked. And that event listener is the one that is going back to make changes within your system. Okay, So you need to keep that in mind. In Android, both the view and the controller gets implemented within the same class or object, specifically the activity class. So you would see in your mind, you need to keep the distinction between the view and the controller in your mind. Okay, uh, now, different people have different views about whether Android supports MVC or not. And here are some examples of what people think of in terms of what should be considered as a model. In model, in Android, for example, people talk about data classes, content providers, and so on that provide wrapping around your data. That could, or an SQLite database, for example, all that could be considered as part of your model. Okay? The controller, all the activities that you implement are in some sense acting as controllers also because in the activities you are implementing event listeners and event handlers to deal with user interaction. So in some sense, the controller part is actually distributed among all the activities that are part of your application. Okay. Now, what you should remember is, if you need to do any business logic or data persistence, don't do it inside the activity. Instead, let it be done in the world. So for example, if you need to update game logic, you are implementing a chess game, for example. You are implementing the movement of chess pieces on the screen. When the user moves the chess piece from one place to another, don't do the thing, the update directly in the view. Instead, let it be sent as a change in the model. In the background, you would probably be modeling the chess board as a as a two-dimensional two array and then you'll be keeping track of where all the chess pieces are on the, on, on, on the array. Let your change that you do on the screen be reflected into that array. Let the model, so for example, you will inform the model saying, I moved this chess piece from here to there, and the model will update this information in it, and then that update may cause your screen to be redrawn. And so this separation has to be done. Again, it's a lot of words that I'm saying, but as you do your application, ask yourselves these questions over and over again. Where is my model? Where is my controller? Where is my view? And keep the separation clear. Okay? The view, again, in Android is often implemented in activities because the Java co code that is closest to the views is often implemented in the activities because these are the ones that are updating the screens and so on. 
So again, the view could be considered as part of activities in, in, in Android system also. So these are some things that I wanted to remind you about. Now, <coughs> some simple suggestions on how you can achieve the, uh, something pretty close to the MVC framework, some simple rules. Try to define as much of your user interface in XML as possible. As much of your user interface in XML as possible. So that separates the view as much as possible into the XML side for rendering the views in CMR. Okay? And only instantiate views if there is no other way of achieving something. In Android, there are two ways of changing views of the screen. For example, if you want to, you can define a button in the XML file that you have seen under layouts, or you can actually define a button by invoking code inside the Android's activity also. There are two ways of doing the same thing, but it's always better, as long as you're not making changes to the screen much, let the layouts be defined more clearly in XML, rather than programmatically changing those. But in some cases, for it, you may have to do it. So for example, don't change the graphical state of views from code as far as possible. For example, don't change the background of a button if the button is deactivated, or the color of a phone if a button was clicked. Do all these through what are called as stateful drawables and selectors in example. Now, we ask, what are the stateful variables and selectors? What the hell am I talking about? <laughs> Certainly, I don't uh, disagree with you. When we come to 2D, 2D graphics, I will explain to you explicitly, showing you, for example, if you want to inform the user that they have selected a particular item, and you want to make some changes on the screen, you can do that without doing any code. You can actually put that into an XML format inside there and then change the color of the button and things like that directly in XML by specifying the different states and so on. And that way you shift as much of the view manipulation into XML as possible. I will even give you examples. When we talk about 2D graphics, I will come to that point in more detail and so on. What are stateful drawables and what are selectors and so on. Okay? So that way, we'll be pushing all that information in there. And the second one, don't do any data saving or logic in your activity classes. If you need to make any changes to the data and so on, don't directly do that in your, that is, <coughs> don't issue um, you know, database instructions directly from your uh, listeners event listeners or event handlers. Instead, hand it over to a controller, which you can implement as a separate class, saying the user touched this button. Hand it over to the controller. Let the controller decide what the touch of the button means. So in the event handler, you simply pass on the message to a controller and let that take care of manipulating the data and so on. Okay? Call to extra, extra model classes for this purpose. This will make your activities sharp and clean because it is possible that the same kind of manipulation could be needed in several different activities. So instead of doing them repeatedly in each of those activities, you can collect it as a separate Java class and then let all that interaction be defined there. If you want to change your data, think about going through a full controller. Controller changes model, model informs controller about the changes, controller changes UI. So I can, instead of having controller change the model on the UI directly. So these are things that you can make use of in order to keep your application very, very 